And yes, yeah, so we're here at the New Blue Art Gallery and Community Center. This space has been open since, well, last year, but we got the space going in 2020. Uh, this place actually used to be a synagogue, and we still use this in a communal way. And currently up is uh, this really beautiful exhibition for the Leaving Our Cultures, uh, which includes many different women from the community. And so please, you know, take some time to check that out as well. Um, I'm really honored to introduce the, the speakers that are here today, and I'm going to just kind of stand on the side. It's really these amazing women who've been doing this work for decades, truly decades, that they've been standing up for Native American rights and against uh, mascots and cultural appropriation and other disrespectful things, uh, not only in sports, but within communities and things that are happening around the nation. Uh, I'd like to introduce Amanda Blackhorse from AZ Rally. Everyone give her a hand. Rhonda Lavaldo, excuse me, from Not In Our Honor. And Gailene Krauser from the Kansas City Indian Center. And we're going to open this up by getting right to the point of why we're here. We're actually here in Las Vegas, Nevada, for those who are tuning into the live feed on Indians.com. And we're here for the first Super Bowl in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. And with the Super Bowl, of course, comes this uh, conundrum of these teams that are here, the Kansas City Chiefs and the 49ers. And we're going to be talking about the harm in sports, the cultural appropriation, and the history of how these women got started with these issues. And I'm going to pass the mic to I believe, Amanda Blackhorse first, and take it away. Okay, yeah, and she Amanda Blackhorse, that's your name, 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 that's your name. I'm originally from Big Mountain, Arizona, and I'm happy to be here on the Nua um, in ancestral territory, and thank you for, for having us here. Um, and thank you to Fong for hosting us in your wonderful art, art gallery here. Um, so I had a little bit of um, uh, something I want to read. Um, but first of all, I just want to talk about a little bit about how I got involved in um, the mascot issue. And it was back in 2005, I was um, at a time when I was really learning about, the, about my own politics and forming my own politics in college. And I met Rhonda at Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas. And, um, she's the one who um, created the group Non Our Honor, and um, and she's like, hey, let's um, let's go protest over at the uh, Kansas City Stadium. Um, the Washington team's going to be here, and the Kansas City team's going to be there, and they're going to play together. It's like this big thing. All the fans are like all excited about. And I have never really experienced anything like that, um, going to a game and seeing how fans act, um, because I've never been to any game, really, any professional game, but seeing all of it was just, um, it was really disheartening to see how people mock us um, and use our culture for, um, for profit, but also just for fun. You know, there was like a restroom that was in the shape of a teepee, um, and people wearing uh, face paint and um, headdresses and stuff like that. So, and all of it was just very normal. Um, and the way that they talked to us and treated us was really disrespectful and very violent. And it was just normalized. And I just couldn't believe that. So, and then after that, uh, Rhonda got me connected to um, one of our great leaders and who started a lot of uh, the fight of, against Native mascots and who started the fight against the Washington um, R word. Um, in DC, Suzanne Harjo, and then I got uh, onto a case um, with, against the Washington team. Um, over the, we litigated over the years, you know, um, won and then lost and then won again and then lost again. Um, so it was just a very long process, but I've learned so much through the process and um, it's really empowered me to fight for our people, um, 
and just for human rights in general. So um, I do have something I want to just read real quick. So, okay. um, it is unfortunate that we are here yet again, one year later, one year later to again call on the KC team to change their name, logo, and cultural appropriation of our people. It is unfortunate we are gathered here as Indigenous people once again as we battle a multi-billion dollar franchise as well as, um, as a corporate giant, the NFL. Especially since the country, especially since this country committed a genocide against our ancestors, it was in this genocide that our culture, language, and spirituality were ripped away from us our children were killed and taken away from us. It was in the name of manifest destiny that the trajectory of our existence on our ancestral territories were forever changed, and now what does this country have to show for that? Stereotyped images of us in professional sports. All so people can have a good time on Sunday. All for entertainment. This country won't let us forget the genocide so we're not able to just get over it. Something the Kansas City fans frequently tell us, and it's clear as Native people, we are expendable and exploitable. This is why I stand with Palestine. The horrors happening in Gaza, and in the West Bank, are exactly what happened to our ancestors. Palestinians have been on, have been and are on their long walk and their trail of tears. As they're being pushed into Rafa, the most southern part of Gaza, they have nowhere else to go. And each day, as the death toll rises, well over 30,000 people have died. They face even more death and destruction every day. When you can't imagine it's getting worse, it does. They have nowhere else to go. Living in an apartheid state like our reservations, Palestinians have lived under occupation for 75 years, just like Native people here for over 500 years. Empathizing with Palestinians' plight does not make one anti-Semitic. It makes you a human being. Indigenous Americans and Palestinians are battling the same colonial giant, the, U the United States. The world used to look to the U.S. as a champion of human rights, but we know that is long over, as tomorrow this country will take part in the celebration of genocide of Native people. One, the Kansas City team dehumanizing Indigenous people versus two, the 40, San Francisco 49ers, who also brutally killed and enslaved Native people in what is now called California during the Gold Rush. This celebration will take place all while a genocide is occurring in real time in Palestine. For decades, Native people have called on the KC team to do away with the name and mockery of our culture. That must continue, but we must also call on the public, the fans, the NFL owners, and sponsors to push for a change. Everyone is responsible so long as you are living on Native land, our land. We must demand the team change their name, end the cultural appropriation, stop the chop, and last but not least, we must demand the U.S. government call for a permanent ceasefire in Palestine and end the occupation. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ronda Lovaldo. I'm Acoma Pueblo from Acoma, New Mexico. And um, again, um, helped found the Not in Our Honor in 2005 when we were just college students and we're still fighting this fight 
trying to right a wrong and just seeing how um, this team doubles down on what they're doing. And so, you know, looking back on when that happened, um, we had a lot of people who came out and supported us, and it was great to see that support. And it was great to see a little bit of movement. Yes, they told people that they couldn't wear headdresses, they couldn't wear face paint, they stopped wore paint with the horse coming in. But they still have headdresses coming in. They still do that. They don't police that at all. Um, you know, we, we point it out all the time. We take pictures of people who are coming in with headdresses, and it's it's a tone deaf statement that they constantly use. Um, you know, one of the things that, for myself, I, I work at a work at Haskell Nations University now, um, which was a boarding school, and one of the things that I noticed that our students have to face is that people mock them with the chant in their face, sometimes at sporting events. The kids that go to school in Lawrence um, in high schools and grade schools are constantly mocked by the chant when they're playing basketball. They shouldn't have to face that. They're just there to play a game, you know? We understand how important sports are. I was an athlete myself. I competed in college. I know how important sports are to your self-esteem. But when you're constantly mocked like that, it's not right. It doesn't feel good. And there's kids are constantly facing this. Um, we're calling this the genocide bowl. Again, like Amanda said, the 49ers. So one stat um, that we were looking at was before um, the 49ers started coming to try and get and find bowl, there was 150,000 indigenous people living in California. After disease, relocation, and massacres, just 31,000 remained. 31,000 indigenous people. And they're still not, and they're not even being talked about. And so we, we want to bring that up because we want to make sure they're included in this, that they are not erased from this history and that they are rightfully talked about during the Super Bowl because they are impacted by it as well. And they should be. They should be talked about. Um, as far as boarding schools, there's a story on Indian Country today about how kids who were sent to boarding schools and they got sick were purposely sent back home to infect their reservations. And they infected thousands of people. And a lot of those kids that got infected passed it on to other kids, and a lot of them died. And the superintendents at these schools knew it. They knew what they were doing. It wasn't like the smallpox focus, it was worse. And that's, you know, with, with Haskell, you know, we weren't allowed to be native. We weren't allowed to have our culture. We weren't allowed to have the languages or ceremonies. But now it's okay for Kansas City to do this to us. And that's not right. They bang a big drum to start everybody off. They do that chant, and it's gonna be seen all over the world. And so we just want people to know how this impacts not only us, but our children and their self-esteem. And those reports that have come out from the APA point to that. So they know what they're doing. They know it's wrong. But they can to say that it's okay. It's, 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 you know, we got the backing of our Native American advisory group of eight people that say it's okay. So we're here. We want to make sure our voices are heard. And we want to make sure the voices of our California Natives are heard as well. It's really important that they're a part of this as well. Good evening. My name is Aileen Krauser. I'm Hunkupapa and Awala, a citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the executive director of the Kansas City Indian Center. <coughs> I've uh, worked in, um, at the Indian Center for a little over 12 years and I served on its volunteer board of directors before that as a camp counselor before that, and that's really why I'm here, is um, <coughs> not just in my role as the director, but as a mom and auntie, because that's why it's, it's so important that we do this. And it's, it's disturbing that we've had to, to look at decades of research and point out decades of research of how this harms our children and harms our communities and um, 
fall on his side. He's staring at Ty Anderson as he says. And despite that, and despite the APA calling for an end to all this in 2005, it is still continuous. And especially in a place like Missouri, because Missouri doesn't have any tribal headquarters in it. The very first thing that they did when they became a state was start passing laws to get Indians out. And as soon as all the treaties were signed, the last one in 1835, they continued to pass laws so that we couldn't even be in the state. And they didn't take that law off the books until 1909. So then in 1924, here comes H. Uh, Roe Bartle. And he gets his, uh, he puts together his fake tribe of Mikasei and the Boy Scouts. And their sole purpose was to appropriate our culture and play Indian and pretend Indian this whole time where we're not allowed to have any of that. They're giving each other Indian names and wearing full-on headdresses <coughs> and, and regalia. They don't want any actual Indians there. They just want to play Indian and pick and take from what, from what they like and use it for their fun and games and sport and profit. And so now, here we are in Kansas City, uh, well, now in Vegas today. I know where I'm at. <laughs> I was in Kansas City earlier. And, and that's how Kansas City is represented. And I know there are some really great people in Kansas City, and there's a lot of really awesome places and um, things that are, are wonderful about Kansas City. But you know, when you Google Kansas City, this is the very first thing that pops up. I mean, these are the ambassadors of Kansas City, are people who don't even live there. They're billionaires from another state that show, uh, they're the ones that give us our image. And our image is racism against the first people from, from the United States. And it's sick. And so not only are we expected to tolerate being represented that way, we're expected to pay for it. In fact, in, in April, on, in, on the next ballot, um, they have uh, pushed through, um, they're, they're wanting a vote on um, a tax to renovate the stadium. And they want the taxpayers to pay for these renovations. But they haven't given any indication on what is actually gonna be paid for. But they certainly have not indicated that it's going to be to change all the racism that's plastered all over that stadium. So now we have to pay for the harm that we're causing to our own kids. It's unacceptable. And so people need to call on the sponsors, the NFL, the team, the friends, the relatives, and vote. Because they're just going to keep shoving this down our throats and, and having us pay for it. And, um, and we're just going to keep calling them on it. Thank you all for speaking, especially for giving some context to the histories and why it's so important to speak out about these things and speak up about them as well. I mean, even locally, we have this uh, high school, the Western Warriors, and they've been very adamant about not changing their name. And even a few years ago, I think oh, Mercedes Marcos, she was in the room <laughs> uh, with me and some other community members, and we tried to educate them, like, hey, let's have a, a discussion with them. You walk into their library, and on every single wall, there's different imageries of native, well, the stereotype of the native, the monolith that, that is made, and also the harm of the stereotype, because once people see that, they think that every native culture is, you know, someone who wears a headdress. Every native culture has a symbolism of the arrow, and every native culture is the same, and that's not true at all. At all. There's over 572 plus Native American federally recognized tribes here in North America, and we all have our own cultures, our own language, our own ways, our own communities. And so, you know, as a Southern Paiute woman, you know, being able to, you know, speak up, you know, for this. Well, the other part, uh, part of my heart is also Southern Cheyenne, you know, these Plains tribes. And so when I see this misuse and appropriation of our symbols, it, it hurts my heart. And even to translate that as Native people to say those things, it's almost like it falls on deaf ears. 
and people don't want to change these things. But it's really amazing that one by one we're seeing mascots being removed, we're seeing the R skins team, you know, change, we're seeing changes throughout America. But it's going to take more. It's going to take more time. And even this action that's happening tomorrow that these women are spearheading is so important and so important for our Las Vegas community. Can, um, can you all just talk a little bit more about um, what is going to happen tomorrow and what people can expect to see and expect to engage in, especially for those that are coming to possibly support for the first time? Yeah, so um, this is my third Super Bowl, unfortunately, <laughs> and um, it doesn't get any better. I think it's gotten worse, so you just see a lot of people coming up to you, um, trying to argue or antagonize you, um, or doing the chop in your face, which is usually what happens to us when we're at the game to Kansas City. Um, for the most part, most of the fans are armed and angry because they've been tailgating and doing their thing. So I expect to have that, um, seeing people in headdresses as well. I think it's okay. Um, you know, it's just it's just a lot of like trying to maintain your temper. Um, and for the most part, I think like for us, unfortunately, we're used to this. <laughs> so we're used to this type of behavior so we don't act on it for the most part or try not to act on it. Um, but yeah, it, it, or they come up with stereotypes. Like when I put on a video, it was a guy, like some woman was saying, you guys want to change the chief's name? And he's like, and we're and Gaby responded, she goes, yes, we want to change the name because you just don't like it. And the guy was like, oh, but you guys like that $30,000 check you receive every month. And I'm like, what? We get a thirty. What? I didn't realize I got a thirty thousand dollar check. Where was I? But it's stereotypes that get tossed in your face like that, and so that's unfortunate because that's the stereotypes that come off of what Kansas City is doing: this cultural appropriation and people not understanding that these things are not real. We don't pay taxes, or we get free education, or free health care, or whatever. You know, it's like you know. These things were paid for. These were part of treaty rights. So, yeah, just expect that. And for the most part, you know, we'll make sure that you know we're there and trying to help out um, and try not to get antagonists too much. And we usually have a couple of the leaders with um, with the megaphones too. So we try to stay on message, you know, and just say the same things over and over. You know, change the name, stop the child. Um, those kind of things, but the signs help a lot because, um, you know, that they can, well, most of them can read. <laughs> and and um, so that that's, I think what annoys them the most is when we just keep smiling, you know, because that doesn't fit their stereotype. When, when we're just, you know, smiling and, and, um, enjoying each other's company and, and they, they, uh, they do get a little bit irritated with that but they can you know their whole get a job and you know throwing all these hurling all these things at us um, we don't let it rattle us anymore it's, we have to have that thick skin but we we've, we've always had to deal with these kind of things because we we grew up in dealing with it always um, in school so so that's why we do it anyway, as so that our kids don't have to just keep with these stereotypes. Also, if you're bringing kids, um, so I have my kids here, so um, they've been to a few protests, so they understand how it usually goes. A lot of them, the fans don't care if kids are there. They'll say really inappropriate things. Um, last year, they were um, saying like sexually inappropriate things in front of the kids and making motions and doing things. And I posted, we posted that on TikTok, and that was banned. It was sort of went against community guidelines. And it's like, well, can you, yeah, I mean, this is what we experienced. So, um, so yeah, just be mindful of that. Um, we definitely um, try to keep the security, you know, we'll, we'll have, probably have our own security win around. So um, just to kind of keep an eye, keep an eye out for each other and for the little ones too.
So you did mention uh, about the appropriation, the use of the headdress. Could you, uh, you know, speak a little bit more about that and why it's offensive? I, mean, I know the answer, but just for those who are just tuning in and are unknowing of these things. Yeah, so um, the headdress is particularly offensive because um, among the Plains tribes, uh, all of those were earned. Every single feather in that was earned by something that you did for the people. Um, and the people that had those were very selfless. It wasn't some warrior, savage um, indication. Those feathers were earned for selflessness and generosity and and, um, and it's been completely twisted by um, Hollywood and all these stereotypes and so that's what makes it especially offensive to people to see people just drunk and wearing these headdresses around as uh, a costume and, and despite the fact that they, the team said that they banned them because they understand uh, the significance, the cultural significance to us, they, they do wear them. And, um, and the NFL hasn't banned them. And so every other stadium in the nation hasn't banned them. And, and so we do see those. And, and there was the, the young person that, that was wearing it just a couple months ago, and there was a big glow above it. And, you know, with the face paint. And so he had the face paint and the headdress and saying, well, he's just trying to cheer on his team. And we get that, you know, we get people wanting to cheer on their team. I mean, why else would you wear a block of cheese on your head? There, we, we understand people want to do that. So if the team has a race of people as its mascot, it's inherently racist. And everything that the people do to try to to celebrate that um, is going to come off that way too. And it's a disservice really to the fans and to Kansas City to continue in that. Kansas City deserves better. Thank you for giving that background. And I'm thinking about, you know, from my Southern Pie ways, like how I could relate or maybe, uh, maybe to show how our people can relate to that. It would be similar if we had somebody who is, you know, had a gourd, so uh, our people do bird songs, salt songs, and they use a gourd, and this is a sacred item, and they use it in ceremony. And it would be similar if somebody was in red face and had that gourd and was just out there drunk, just waving it around. It would be the exact same thing. It would be absolutely offensive. It would be hurtful, absolutely harmful. And when I think about these things, I'm thinking about it because, and you're saying this, because I, well, there's a lot of people, even other Native people, that don't understand it quite yet. Or they're not seeing it as the gravity as, you know, well, that's not my culture or my tribe or what's the big deal. And so there's a lot of education to do. And, uh, you know, a lot of grace to lend to try to, you know, really build that education and those connections between people who have a lot to learn. And it certainly took myself a long time to learn, too, no matter who my aunt is. I really had to educate myself about these things and really think about it. When we think about, you know, those who are even trying to find their place or find their way, you know, uh, growing up, like to say, here in Las Vegas, here in the city, uh, we have a really large urban native population who's just trying to, you know, figure out who they are or they were raised here and not on their reservation or not with their culture. And sometimes these individuals are grasping onto these symbols because it's the only connection they think they have. But I think that it's really important to, you know, keep building that education, keep talking about that, because people have a lot to learn. And I think there's more to learn, too, especially with this protest. And I hope that more people are going to come out and join and walk with us and be able to attend and learn. Um, I Myself, I, I'll admit, I'm a little uh, afraid. I'm a little afraid. But at the same time, when I next to some badass aunties like yourselves <laughs> that are here and knowing that you're paving the way, I feel more confident to attend. I feel stronger to attend. Knowing that there's other Native men here in this room that are going to be carrying the drum, that are going to be carrying the songs for us, carrying the beat for us, 
and that makes me feel good, and that feels really good, you know, to be a part of this. And so I'm proud to to join y'all, to join y'all truly, you know, in the Las Vegas' first Super Bowl. So I hope that a lot of you can also, you know, come out, support, and uh, maybe Amanda, if you could talk more about what time we're meeting, where we're going to meet at, and, you know, what the plan is for, for tomorrow. I think you guys need to help me on this one. Um, so tomorrow, we are meeting at, um, so we're asking folks to, um, we're, we're meeting at noon, but we're gonna meet on Polaris Avenue and Hacienda. And that area, I understand, is closed for uh, through traffic. So if we're asking people to do ride share, or maybe share a carpool using a ride share and get dropped off near that area, and then you'll probably have to walk to uh, Polaris Avenue and Hacienda. Um, is it Hacienda Boulevard? Yes. yes, and so that whole area right there will be, the Hacienda Road will be blocked, but we'll, we're gonna kind of hang around in that area. So, um, yeah, so meet us at uh, 12 p.m. Um, anything else to mention? Yeah, they did say that the ride shares might take longer than usual. Okay, yeah, and ride sharing might take longer than usual, so it might be good to maybe start a, a couple of hours before. That's what we're going to do. We're going to probably we're going to meet up um, actually here, and then we're going to carpool or take ride share ride share from here, right? Yep. So if you want to do that, if you want to come here at 10, 10, 15 or so, we're going to be here and we're going to ride share out together. I just wanted to add, um, so the Super Bowl does have a code of conduct, and it'd be a shame, it'd be a shame if they were, you know, not paying attention to this code of conduct. So it says offensive language. I'll just pull it away from your mouth a little okay. bit. Offensive language or obscene gestures, this includes the use of such language or gestures concerning a person's race, ethnicity, color, gender, religion, creed, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, or national origin, or to instigate, incite, or encourage a confrontation or physical assault. Conduct violations, stadium staff, can be reached at this text message hotline. So anytime you see that chat going on, you can call them at 725-780-2345, and they have to take that call. And it's like, so why would you put this out and you're instigating this racism against a whole race of people? And how, are they gonna take it seriously? We're gonna put this out tomorrow as a call to action. If you see this, on television, call this number because that's their code of conduct. They had this code of conduct at the draft in Kansas City, and there was plenty. We were out protesting, and there was plenty of people who were very rude to us and doing the chop at our faces and saying derogatory things to us. And I was like, "What? What's with the code of conduct not being followed?" So, yeah. So that's their code of conduct. You can find that on their website. Thank you, and this is also a call to other Native American people who make Vegas their home. If you want to touch base with your culture, with your circle of people, join us. Join us. We're going to be in a protective circle of these amazing women, other community members, and not just our own Native peoples, but others who are allies, others who want to stand with us, to support us, to be a part of this movement, truly, because this is something that's been going on for decades, but it doesn't have to continue. It doesn't have to continue. We just keep acting on this, keep making our voices known, and keep spreading education about the issues, then we're gonna get further. We're already you know, getting there. I feel very positive about this. And uh, lastly, I think we wanna open it up for questions. Did any of you have anything else to say before we open it up for questions? Oh, 
So you can find out information on where we're meeting on notmyhonor.com uh, or our Facebook page that we're posting stuff there too. Thank you. Notinourhonor.com. Okay, notinourhonor.com. And also for those looking for more education about this, there's a, an amazing documentary that came out called Imagining the Indian. If you can go to YouTube, you can see the trailer for Imagining the Indian. And look at this documentary because it really details the history of racism in sports, the movements, what has been happening over these past few decades, and what is continuing. And now we're going to open it up to some questions from those who are attending here. Does anybody have any questions related to this, uh, the action that's happening tomorrow, or any questions for the women that are on the panel? Yes, uh, Mercedes Marcos, Olala, Lakota. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could share some of the progress that you have seen. I know, you know, the name change itself was something that, I mean, I had hoped for, but I did not think that I would see in my own lifetime. Are, what are some of the positives or some of the movement that you have seen? Could you please share that with us? So um, speaking for the, the Washington NFL team, that's definitely um, a plus, right? They eventually changed their name. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I mean, I think it had a lot to do with the pressure that we put on them throughout the years and the lawsuits and everything like that. Um, but it, you know, eventually it changed um, in 2020 during the revolution, the Black Lives Matter revolution and after um, George Floyd was murdered. Um, and rest in peace, George Floyd. Um, so I think that's what really pushed in, you know, the the issue, you know, over the edge and, and made them change. And I think Kansas City was kind of waiting in the corner, like, oh, are they gonna, are we next, you know? And they kind of got off scot free. Um, so I mean, it's it's a big plus, but there's still more work that needs to be done. Um, so, in, in addition to uh, Washington, um, Cleveland changed theirs, and they're now they're the uh, the Guardians, and they're we've seen a lot happening in schools, and so just in Kansas City in the Shawnee Mission School District, there were four schools that were Chiefs, Braves, Indians, um, and there was another one, but I don't recollect. Um, but they. Um, there were some children that, that were saying, you know what, I don't want to graduate from a school called the Indians. And so even though it had been named the Indians, they, they took it upon themselves and they, uh, what they did was pretty cool. And they took some stones and they put faces of contemporary Native leaders and historic Native leaders. And they would just, uh, go in at night and put a few out and so eventually over the course of time it was just lining the entire walkway up to the administration building and then they were saying now you know these are people that represent us not this not not what you have in the you know painted on the gymnasium floor and they finally got this the um, school district to change uh, district-wide and remove all the mascots. And so we are seeing these young people taking it upon themselves because they don't want to be represented that way. They don't want to, to have that um, be on their diplomas, you know, and they're, um, you know, when they're, when they're moving forward from high school. So we're seeing that, and we're also seeing entire states passing legislation to ban mascots in schools. And so even though sometimes it comes up and it doesn't pass, the fact that it's there at all is progress. And so, you know, the more that this stuff can get out there, you know, the more we stand up and make people aware. Because one of the things that surprises me when we're out at these protests is some of the people that walk by are just vile, but some of the people that walk by, the look on their face like they had never even considered that anybody would ever not be okay with it because the teams that have these mascots spend a ton of money and a ton of PR making it look like they are doing uh, wonderful things in Native communities and that they have our backing. 
even though they don't, and the majority of us are opposed. If they can find one person to use a seat human shield, they will, and make it look like it's all good, and it's obviously not. So the more people that we can get up, you know, get together and say, no, it's not, then the better off it, that we'll be. Do we have any other questions? Any announcements? Um, well, actually, I do have a question. Maybe not a question, uh, because I was asked, I've never been to a Super Bowl. I've never been in the arena as these women have been. And so I was really leaning on them, like what to expect and you know, to kind of demystify that, what to do. And, you know, kind of <laughs> really getting myself ready to just, you know, kind of take that on. I think I've spent just the past couple of years with a lot of self-care and to really just kind of build myself back up, like, you know, just holistically, you know, to be able to do these things. So it's a big step for me to even step back into the ring, so they would say. But I think that it's important now, you know, more than ever, to be able to stand up to these things. Is there anything that, uh, you know, maybe here in the city of Las Vegas, uh, you all coming from different cities, uh, but the things that you've done or calls that you've made to maybe your legislator, city, this and that, is there anything that maybe we can do in the city of Las Vegas that can make a difference? Um, so I think community is just so important. So getting you know people around you, creating um, you know um, specific groups where you know you talk about these issues. And um, and I was going to mention also too. You mentioned imagining the Indian, um, the the documentary um, that uh, we're all in, um, and it's about uh, the Washington team, but also the Kansas City team and other fights as well. And uh, it's a really great documentary, very well put together, and it's actually streaming on I want to promote you guys, but Amazon and Apple. Um, and it's, so it's, I mean, it's more accessible now for people to see. So maybe you could host like a, a movie night or something like that and bring everyone in and watch the, the um, documentary. But also in Arizona, because we hosted um, several, uh, I think several Super Bowls, and last year it was in Arizona, so we all were out there. Um, and um, so we tried to push the Kansas City, or not Kansas City, the, um, the Arizona Cardinals, um, the team to ban headdresses and uh, red face in the stadium and never got a response. So something we need to keep pushing more, uh, you know, keep pushing them on, um, but that's something that you can probably do here um, and get the stadium, Allegiant Stadium, to, to possibly, um, you know, ban headdresses and red face. So I, I wrote an email and a letter um, and sent it to our city council and our, our legislators and our um, representatives in Congress and, and basically just, it was practically one of those research papers with all the, all the links to all the research to show them because it's not just us being offended by something, it's, it's causing actual harm to our kids and our communities. and so. Um, so that when we make them aware, they at least can't say, well, I didn't know. Because if you send, if you send a letter, if you send an email, if you send a text, then, then, they, then they do know, and they are aware, and, and they can't plead ignorance anymore. I was going to say that I I'm very proud, you know, we did pass legislation in our state uh, against the mascots. However, what has ended up happening is the school districts don't take action on it. So I, I think we need another resurgence of the work we used to do and get out to those schools, get out to school board meetings, things like that. Do you have any ideas? Have you seen that before where, you know, it is changed in the legislature, uh, but the districts they come up with some excuse not to follow it? That is a great question, Mercedes Marcos Cross. 
I can say one of our um, members is Carol Cadu Blackwood, and she is a part of the Lawrence School Board District. So she's been very instrumental in trying to get them to implement Native American curriculum, not in, just in the Lawrence School District, but also to push forward in that Kansas House of Representatives, where we do have a Native American woman in the House and pushing forward with the school their, um, education committee to try and push for Native American curriculum in the state. So, you know, there, you have to have people there pushing for that. And, and I'm really, it's awesome that we're getting that in Kansas because Kansas is very conservative. <laughs> but they also have people who put their foot in the mouth and they say not so great stuff. Um, and so they use that to push forward what they're trying to do. It's like, well, you're, you're stereotyping people. And so that helps out as well. Um, but if anything, like Amanda was talking about the Imagine the Indian, that movie, like if you can watch it and say, oh, I still don't cheer for Kansas City. Like, <laughs> you can't, because it's just laying it out for you, straight out, like why this is wrong. So um, I would say have a watch party for your school board for your educators that are in the community to say, why are we still doing this? Why are we still having these Native American mascots in schools? That's what I would give, throw it on them, say, and, and walk, watch this movie. Thank you for those suggestions, and thank you for bringing up maybe we should have the resurgence of things that we started years ago. Uh, yeah, because to be honest, it just felt like such a battle it was such a battle for the few of us to really speak up for basic human rights, for basic <laughs> respect, respect truly. And you know what came with it was just a whole slew of hundreds and thousands of just hate and derogatory words towards us. And it was just really demeaning and it was just, just disheartening and it just felt ugly. It just felt so ugly. And so, you know, for for those of you, you, you've been in this for decades. You've really been the leaders with it, and you've stayed strong with it. What advice could you have for, well, me and other Native people who are just, you know, really wanting to, to fight for this, but how do we do it, and how do you really stay as strong as you are, you know, in this movement? Well, I have gay lead. <laughs> <laughs> Have some other strong Native sisters with you, because you can't do it alone. I know that. I cannot. I and I knew that. Like when we first started having the meetings in 2005, I told them like there was times I'm like I can't do this by myself. You know, like I need people to support. <laughs> and so I really, you really do need a support staff and support sisters and brothers that are really going to be there for you. And. You know, just making sure they're, you know, everything's going to be okay. But also just to like hash over all the crazy. So I know like after this is done, me and Gaylene are probably going to be in a crying mess over whatever happened. <laughs> but I mean, but that's good. You know, crying's not a bad thing. It's not a sign of that you're not strong. It's good to like release all those emotions and negativity and have your strengths and power for your own communities, um, whatever that is. Um, even my mom, she was just like, make sure you have this, and make sure you have this, and you're, you're blessing yourself. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but she even knows that we have in our Native communities things that you put and carry with yourself to keep you strong, right? That you do to bless yourself. And, and I hope we'll do that tomorrow too, you know? Within our own our way of way to bless bless everybody to make sure that we go in with right good positive feelings and, and not to get down. So yeah, that's what I that's my things I suggest. Same. I don't, I don't really have anything to add, but yeah, definitely it's always like in a prayerful way. And, and I always like give credit to the grandmas, you know, because that's what that's what they did, even when it was hard. You know, they were just one foot in front of the other because they didn't know if they're walking in the right way, it's all gonna be okay. And so you just do it that way, like they did, you know, put one foot in front of the other and, and walk in a good way and it'll be okay. 
So everything that you guys said, <laughs> um, but also um, I think a lot of self care definitely, um, and know when to step back. Um, I've had to step back um, several times and just like take a deep breath and um, tend to my family and just you know go back to my community and and just really take care of myself, um, you know, because burnout is very real. I'm also a social worker. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and so we learn a lot about self-care there. And so um, I think that's probably the biggest thing. And um, I think women are just so incredibly strong. And, um, you know, the, a lot of the people that have been in this way throughout the years are, are strong, strong women. and. Um, and learning from them and leaning on them, I think, is just super important. Um, but also the, the youth, you know, now I'm like, you know, we're all becoming anti, we're all aunties now, and we gotta bring our youth and we gotta teach them. So I try to take my kids to different things um, so that they can learn, um, because unfortunately they will have to take on this burden, you know. So. Um, so it, it is like a, it's like a burden, but also it gives me a lot of um, strength and empowerment to be able to teach them um, the, the good parts of this work. And the good parts of this work that's coming up tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow we're going to be in this beautiful circle with these amazing women. Uh, we're going to be standing together at the Allegiant Stadium. We're going to be meeting uh, here at New Arts Carpool at 10 a.m. Sunday morning, February 11, 2024. And then we're going to be heading over to the Allegiant Stadium. We're going to be meeting at Polaris and Hacienda. and Hacienda tomorrow. So for those who would like to join us, please do. For those who would like to meet us here, you know, please do. Or we'll see you tomorrow, uh, tomorrow for Sunday. And for those that can't make it with us, you know, please take the time to, to continue to educate yourselves. Educate yourselves. Please watch that film, Imagining the Indian. And, yeah, hi. Last words? Yeah, um, thank you again for hosting us because we don't know anything here in Vegas, and it really helps to have boots on the ground, people helping us and telling us where we can go and where we can set up. And it, it really, it, this is not an easy job. We have to plan it out. Totally planned this out. We've been planning this out since Kansas City won. And it, it's just been amazing that and you guys have been um, extending your friendship and your, your place here and your space. And we really appreciate that. Um, we couldn't do it by ourselves. We know that. We understand that. Thank you. Yes, well, we love when you. We appreciate all of you coming out tonight, too, and you know, sharing that good positive energy with us. It, that's that is one of the things that keeps us going. Yes, again, so hello everyone. Thank you very much. My family and I are very appreciative, and thank you, Tom, for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all who came to join us tonight. Uh, the community has made some amazing food. There's plenty of food in the next building. Please join us for, for that. Uh, there's some water and such. Bathrooms in the back. And again, those of you who join us online, thank you as well. Bye.